Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. This week we saw a flurry of activity across the state as COVID-19 numbers continue to break records and voters headed to the polls on Tuesday for the primaries. We also see businesses continue to reopen and protests occur across the state. I speak with Joey Von Nessen, who's a USC economist, about how the economy is doing in South Carolina and the country and also recap the primaries with Associated Press reporter Meg Kennard. This and more on This Week in South Carolina. Despite reaching a plateau weeks ago, South Carolina has seen its new COVID-19 case numbers skyrocket, doubling from Memorial Day weekend to last week, and if trends hold, a weekly record is expected this week. Today I am um, more concerned about COVID-19 in South Carolina than I have ever been before. For the past two weeks, we've seen some of our highest daily numbers since the pandemic began. And there have also been recent increases in our percent positive, which tells us that um, more people than we would hope for who are being tested are sick. This is why we need everyone's help in re-emphasizing how critical it is for every one of us every day to wear a mask in public and to stay physically distanced from one another. Governor Henry McMaster said he would not be shutting down businesses again as there are guidelines businesses and customers should be following. But guidelines don't cover everything. Another word for it, be smart. There's a lot of stupid floating around out there, here, here and there. There's a lot of reckless, careless activity. We ask everybody to be very careful. But protocols like distancing and wearing masks were not on display at State Representative Nancy Mace's victory party Tuesday when she swept the first congressional district Republican primary. I would also like to thank Brad Mole, Chris Cox, and Kathy Landing for stepping into the arena. It is not easy to decide to run for office and come under that kind of scrutiny. And I'll be reaching out to them and asking for their support because we've got to get together starting tonight. Every single one of us, Republican, Independent, and maybe a few Democrats, have to come together and unite to take back this seat for the Low Country. Safeguards were in place for voters on primary day, but with several polling precincts consolidated into one location, like at West Ashley High School, where voters waited for more than two hours, it's hard to say how beneficial they were. Yeah, I think it's a, a big mess. I also heard that some staff didn't show up that they were expecting to have show up, and so uh, I've heard other precincts were like essentially no line at all. So it was basically uh, this is just one that probably needs a little bit of work and a little bit more staff to come next time. Another concern is that protesters may spur outbreaks due to social distancing concerns. Though a majority of those marching from the governor's mansion to the state house last Friday were wearing masks, including members of the University of South Carolina football team. The, the more you know about somebody, the more you feel comfortable with them. And that's what we've got to continue to do. Actions are louder than words. I can put out a uh, a paragraph on, on social media, that does nothing compared to what we did Friday as a football team. Joining me now to recap some of Tuesday's primary results is Associated Press reporter Meg Kennard. Meg, welcome back. Thank you so much. It's great to be back, good even to, virtually. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see that quarantine's treating you well. Uh, but <laughs> let's talk about what we saw on Tuesday. We had some record high turnout here, 22.7% uh, turnout uh, in South Carolina at the polls on Tuesday. We saw about 170,000 absentee ballots mailed back, cast by the mail or in person at certain locations. Uh, so record high numbers that we saw because, again, absentee uh, balloting, absentee voting was available to anyone in South Carolina that wanted to do it no restrictions. Uh, but we did see some some issues because of that as well. So tell me a little bit about what we saw with the record high numbers, uh, what maybe drove that, and then also some of the some of the blunders we saw as a result, perhaps. Election officials had presumed for a long time that we were going to see a lot of differences with this year's election, in part because of, of course, as you referenced, the pandemic and some questions about what's going to happen in person and a lot of people trying to vote by mail. What we saw on election day were really long lines in some places. That was due to a lot of things. There weren't as many poll workers in some places who were scared to come to work and volunteer this year because of the pandemic. Social distancing was in place. So you can't have as many people in a polling place at the same time. And then once you get in there, it's just a little bit different process. So we saw that happening. On the other side of that, we saw so many more people choosing, in large part because of the pandemic, to vote by mail. So that's just a more cumbersome process. And I don't use that negatively, but it does take more time to count those votes. So all of those things coming together meant that in some places on election day, 
there were people voting in line way past midnight. We saw that here in Richland County. That happens sometimes. It's obviously not something that you want, but you know, ultimately we did get the votes counted. We did get the races called. Um, elections officials are confident about the results, but it certainly wasn't as smooth of a process as I think some of them may have liked for this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another issue when we saw, you know, fewer poll workers, like you're saying, consolidated precincts, inexperienced poll workers led to some confusion. I was down at West Ashley, West Ashley High School, and I got there and lines were two hours long, and I know they got longer, uh, longer in the day as well. And you covered some of the Richland County problems. And Richland County is sadly notorious for election problems. What have you been hearing? Uh, are we going to see any changes uh, in the future as a result of what we saw at Richland County on Tuesday? Yet to be seen. The governor was asked about that this week. You'll recall that last year he actually got rid of the entire Richland County Election Board, in part because of some problems about votes not being counted in elections past. He said this week that he is not of the mind to do that after this year's election, giving officials some leeway, in part, he said, because of changes due to the COVID-19 outbreak. But I think it is safe to say that there is going to be a continuing conversation about why we continue to see these problems in Richland County, even under different election board leadership. There have been multiple leaders change place over the past couple of years, and there still seem to be these long lines. So that conversation will continue, and many people hope, I would imagine everybody hopes, they get it well cleared up before the November general election. Mm -hmm. And Meg, I know we, uh, we're still wondering about, you know, extending absentee voting in November. Absentee voting by mail, again, would be helpful, especially if, if situations have not changed like we saw. Uh, it be, you know, a, it was a positive this past week because people didn't want to be near each other, they didn't want to go out. Uh, so I'm wondering, is this kind of a worrisome preview of what we might see in November if things don't really change, unless maybe we see some more messaging to get more people to vote absentee, that we might see this repeat, we might see these long lines, these big hiccups in some places. Other places, you know, voting was a breeze, some people said it was easy. Sure, so the, we're looking at these isolated cases here, but I'm just wondering if it, it could be like this, it could be more widespread, especially if if the COVID-19 pandemic is still as prevalent as it is right now, if not more. There certainly could be some issues coming up in November, but one thing is certain that state election commission officials are watching this very carefully. They've already um, come out publicly to say that they are going to send assistance to Richland County, particularly in terms of poll worker training and also getting some more information about how to use the voting equipment if we're doing this during the pandemic. So coming up in November, who knows what's going to happen with the outbreak, but at least that does give the state several months to really think about this scenario. Now that they've seen it play out in real time, in some places not very smoothly, it gives them time to really think about what changes they're going to need to implement for a general election. And switching gears to some results from Tuesday's primary night, I know you were covering Senator Lindsey Graham's race. Uh, he easily won the nomination there. Tell me about that race and where it goes now at this point. It feels like for months already, this race has already been kind of in general election mode. We've seen Democrat Jamie Harrison, who secured his own nomination several months ago when he became the only Democrat still seeking it. We've seen him going after Lindsey Graham fairly hard for months now. So now that the primary is officially over, that Lindsey Graham is officially the nominee of the Republican Party, we're going to see more um, activity for sure. We've already seen a lot of money raised. This race is well on pace to be the most expensive ever in South Carolina history with Lindsey Graham, I think upwards of um, $21 million, Jamie Harrison more than $15 million, and that's not including the PACs that are also going to be out in full support of their candidates and the parties themselves and the party apparatus who are going to be coming to help them raise money and get out the word. So safe to say, aside from the presidential contest, this Senate race is the one, one of the major ones to watch here in South Carolina. And I think we're really going to see it ramping up now that we've got the primary behind us. Yeah, and it calls for debates and, you know, like you said, more outside money coming in. We'll probably see the president start throwing his weight around, too, I'm assuming, as well. Particularly now that he and Senator Graham are on the same page. Remember, that hasn't always been the case in years past, but at least recently in February, I think the day before the Democratic presidential nominating contest here, we saw the president come to South Carolina to hold a, an event with Lindsey Graham in North Charleston. So I think we're definitely going to see more activity on the national level for sure. 
Speaking of the national level, we did see President Donald Trump uh, endorse State Rep Nancy Mays, who is now the GOP nominee for the 1st Congressional District. She'll be challenging uh, Democrat Joe Cunningham. She won that race outright on Tuesday. Uh, was that a surprise? What, what do you take away in terms of how she managed to just really blow out that field of three other contenders and just secure that nomination outright? Nancy Mace has been campaigning hard for that nomination for about a year now already. Um, she came into this with a fairly high level of name recognition, in part because she's already an elected state representative, but also in her own right, she's the first female graduate of the Citadel Military College here in South Carolina. So for a lot of those reasons, Nancy Mace has already been somewhat of a known name. She also worked for President Trump's first campaign in 2016 here in South Carolina. And so you know, some would say that that may not be a benefit to her in the first district, but I feel that she has tried to toe that line somewhat carefully talking about how she does support the president, but also probably keeping in mind that she's in a district that was recently, for the first time in decades, flipped to Democratic control. So Nancy Mace is, you know, she definitely came into that in somewhat different circumstance than the other three competitors for the Republican nomination there, but it is very safe to say that that is going to be an incredibly active race now that it's going to get started in the general election contest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we already saw, uh, you know, she had the heavy fundraising in that race, and then also we're seeing outside money already come in in support mm -hmm. of Joe Cunningham attacking Nancy Mays uh, from outside groups, too. So something, uh, I'm guessing, is probably the top race, like you said, to watch at this point? It's definitely one, and it's on all of those lists. You know, it depends on who you talk to, but it's either a toss-up or it leans Democrat or, you know, it's possible Republican pickup. I think the parties are going to always spin that information to the best of, of what's going to benefit them the most. But that's particularly because Joe Cunningham was the first Democrat to win down there in about 40 years in 2018. Mm -hmm. It's been at the top of Republican likely or, you know, ideally a pickup. It's been at the top of their list ever since he won that um, general election that year. So there's going to be a lot of money coming in. It's already gotten a lot of national attention. Like you said, the NRCC has been talking about Nancy Mace for quite some time. We saw the DCCC coming out talking about her almost immediately after her race was called in a news release of their own. And that's only going to continue. And Meg, uh, we have about one minute left. I don't know if you saw any other surprises or big race results uh, that caught you off guard uh, on Tuesday. There were some at the local level. Obviously, here in Richland County, we saw our coroner, Gary Watts, get upended by a Democratic challenger. That's very local, um, but that is something that's interesting to see when you see that there hasn't been a whole lot of controversy in an area and you see an incumbent losing. But there are also some um, questions in, in the State House. You know, we saw a couple of folks like Luke Rankin, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, end up in a runoff. Um, that's always interesting. Mm -hmm. And you see someone who's in one of those powerful leadership positions. So we'll be watching that in two weeks. Yeah, runoff in two weeks. Meg, with the Associated Press, we appreciate catching up with you, and we'll be following your work throughout the rest of the election season. Thanks, Meg. Of course. Thank you. Joining me now for a look at the state and national economy is Dr. Joey Von Nessen. He's a research economist at the Darla Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina. Joey, thanks for coming back. Hope you're doing well. Doing well. Great to see you, Gavin. Appreciate the invitation. Great, great. Uh, Joy, I want to start with some uh, South Carolina numbers. We just got the unemployment numbers out, unemployment claim numbers for the previous week out this week, uh, and it shows that after seven weeks, we're now seeing a, a slight tick up uh, in claims. You know, we've been seeing seven weeks of declines, and now we see uh, 22,734 unemployment insurance claims. I'm wondering uh, if this is obviously just the first time we've seen it tick up in a while. Uh, if that's a worrisome trend, what do you read into when you see that number moving up at this point? Well, it is a fairly minor minor change from the directional shift that we've seen in recent weeks. So unemployment insurance claims have been steadily ticking downwards, which has been very positive. I think in the coming weeks, we're likely to see a couple of reasons why that could change just a, a bit. One is because of the PPP dollars that was uh, allowed to be spent over an eight-week period. That was the initial restriction. That's been extended somewhat now, but that initial that initial restriction of eight weeks is making a difference. And so we could see layoffs that result as a result of businesses who received that cash, had to spend it on payroll, and now are still struggling from a lack of demand. So you're going to see some effects there. And then also we are continuing to see some some layoffs because as businesses come back and see more demand, they're still somewhat restricted based on the social distancing guidelines in terms of what they can do. So I think these fluctuations are, are fairly normal and we'll expect those to continue. But in general, the trend has been moving in a positive direction in terms of fewer layoffs and fewer unemployed people overall as we've moved into late May and into June now. 
Mm -hmm. And I know some of those layoffs, uh, a good bit of those layoffs, uh, unemployment claims were uh, focused on the restaurant industry. And I've heard from some people that actually some restaurants have actually had to close because their their employees are getting sick with COVID-19 since we're reopening. I'm wondering how does that factor into you know economic outlook going forward? And do you think that undermines our, our confidence as consumers? And maybe do we open too soon? What are your thoughts when it comes to those kind of ramifications? Well, it absolutely makes a difference. And what I like to call that is the social hangover effect. That is how comfortable are people coming back in, going to restaurants, resuming normal interactions. And I think as we go into the summer, we're going to see more businesses be proactive about maintaining and creating spaces where employees and customers can be safe and don't have to worry about getting sick. Because if, if customers aren't comfortable coming back into restaurants or offices or anywhere else, then that's going to hurt the businesses. They're, they're going to suffer from a lack of demand. So they have every incentive to create processes and spaces that can allocate sufficient resources to social distancing and to make their customers feel safe because it really does all come down to consumer confidence and how willing they are to get back to more normal spending activity and more normal social interactions. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, when we look at the unemployment numbers, we haven't seen uh, unemployment numbers for May for South Carolina yet, but uh, in April, we had record unemployment at 12.1%. Um, that number kind of ticked down a little bit nationally in May. I'm wondering what if we should be hopeful, if we should maybe perhaps expect to see maybe unemployment rates tick down as well in April if, 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 we, if we mirror national trends. What are your thoughts on that when we look at unemployment? So when we look at unemployment, I, I think it's possible that we could go in either direction. I think what we're seeing now in terms of stepping back and looking at the directional shifts that the U.S. and South Carolina economy has seen, we saw basically the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, in terms of the depths of the shutdown in April. And that's what that 12.1% unemployment rate considers for South Carolina. So the unemployment rate, in a sense, is a, is a lagged indicator, a lagging indicator of about a four to six week period. And so as we picked back up, we've seen people go back to work, but we've seen some initial or some additional layoffs occur back to what we talked about before, because in some cases, the PPP money is, is running out for businesses. Some businesses are just now getting to the point where they're having to, to go through the layoff phase, that they've had excess uh, financial reserves, that they've been able to stave off any any reduction in staff. So I think at this point, we're not likely to see any sizable increase in the unemployment rate, but it could fluctuate either either way. We're just now getting our feet on the ground from an economic perspective in terms of a recovery. And this new unemployment rate that we see in South Carolina is going to reflect that. So again, I think it could go slightly up or slightly down, but it's probably going to stay close to where to that 12% level. And we'll see some improvement hopefully by June when we see the June report come out. And Joey, before, I, look, we, before we talk about national outlook stuff and, and information we heard from the Fed this week, I want to ask you a little bit about what you and your colleagues are, are looking at or researching as we you know, are several months now into this pandemic. What are you looking for? What, what research are you uh, keeping an eye on, numbers, uh, rates, trends? Well, one of the interesting patterns that we are observing relative to more populated cities and more rural areas of the United States is in the last decade, we've seen a trend of movement away from, from cities. Not to a significant extent, but there has been a lower growth rate in major cities in, in the U.S. And I think what's happening now is we're going to see an exacerbation of that trend. People are going to be more reluctant to want to live in, in, in crowded cities where they can't social distance. And especially now that working from home is becoming a new normal in many, in many sectors, it's very likely that South Carolina is going to have an additional competitive advantage in the coming years once we get through this pandemic. Because as you know, South Carolina has a fairly low cost of living relative to most states. We have a high degree of natural amenities and there are a number of benefits to living in a more rural area where, again, the population density is just not as high. And so if you're a worker and you're a little leery of setting up in a, in a crowded city in the aftermath of, of the pandemic, South Carolina becomes an attractive alternative if you can work wherever you wherever you want. And so you can imagine employees working for companies headquartered anywhere from New York to California 
but we get the benefit of them living here, spending their wages here, and supporting the local economy. So I think South Carolina, if it's proactive in, in, the, in the right way strategically, can really capture and, and take advantage of, this, of the changing migration patterns in the coming years as we move into this economic recovery period. Mm -hmm. So kind of a big ramification of, of this situation going on that we'll be keeping an eye on. Also something I guess that we, we saw business leaders and other leaders trying to make sure that we still maintain our competitive advantage with Accelerate SC, that task force the governor set up there. Uh, something that they, they're talking about wanting to capture as a result of all this. Um, but Joey, one of the big issues that came out of that was the need for greater broadband access in the state. So I'm guessing when we look at that, that's gonna be one of those critical infrastructure needs, just like roads that we are seeing it slowly improving in the state and, and water and electricity. So is that gonna be maybe the big, uh, big issue when it comes to making sure that you can actually have these people move from other parts of the country into South Carolina and ensure that they can do business as normal? Absolutely. I think it needs to be a high priority. And I think Accelerate SC recognizes that there's been funding allocated to expanding broad base, uh, broadband access statewide. So that's a, a very important consideration. And especially given that South Carolina is continuing to see strong, uh, we're seeing strong interest in South Carolina rather by, by businesses. And the Department of Commerce has reported consistently that they are continuing to do site visits. Most of them now are, are virtual. But, but there's still strong interest in South Carolina in the long run. And I think that's the important broader perspective is that, yes, we're going through a, a recession right now, and it's, it's, it's certainly creating problems for, for the state's economy. But the long-term competitiveness of South Carolina is going to remain and will probably be even improved a, as an outcome of this. So as we really turn the page and really start on this recovery process as we move into the summer, I think that's, that's an important perspective to keep in mind as we move forward. And Joey, you mentioned the word recession. We heard this week that the U.S. entered a recession in February. Uh, we've spoken previously on this program about how it seemed like we in South Carolina and ever, everywhere else hit the pause button for several weeks there early on to combat the spread of COVID-19. I'm wondering, when are, you gonna, when are we gonna really know the extent of the damage done to our economy as a result of that? Um, and maybe if you've already seen some, some numbers pointing that besides the unemployment rate and unemployment insurance claims. Well, I think the biggest concern that, that I have as we look ahead is whether or not we're going to see significant underemployment for, for a period of time. And we're not going to know that for several months, again, until the economy begins to open back up and we see how quickly people return to work and what their hours are and what the demand looks like. That's going to be tough to assess. But until we get a widespread treatment or a vaccine in place, many businesses are still going to be operating at limited capacity, whether that's 50%, 80%, that's going to depend on the business, but they're going to continue to face some restrictions due to social distancing and this social hangover effect. And that can cause persistent underemployment in terms of reduced hours or reduced wages. So I think in the short run for 2020, that's, that's, that's a concern that, that we have based on what, what data we have available at this point. And we'll just have to see how that plays out. But as we move into the second half of the year, again, we're hopeful that we'll continue to see the economy build some momentum and employment will be recaptured along and along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've seen from the Fed uh, issued some outlook this week showing that they expect the economy to contract by 6.5% and have uh, year-end unemployment around 9.3%. So kind of sobering figures there, but is that just... That's just something we have to build into our outlook going forward at this point. Business have, businesses uh, you know, understand that, then I guess hopefully try and outperform those numbers? Yes, I think that's a, a realistic assessment of, of, of what we anticipate. So uh, I, we were at 3.2% unemployment in March. We're at 12.1% now. And I think if we can get back to single digits, maybe in the 8 to 9% range by the end of this, this year, that would be success for South Carolina in the absence of, of, of any treatment. And so that's that's fairly consistent, but I think businesses are they're aware of that, but they're just trying to rebuild as quickly as they can. And of course, the the other concern for the latter half of, of 2020 is whether we see an additional outbreak in in the fall that some of the epidemiologists are currently uh, uh, anticipating as a possibility. Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's important to keep that in perspective too, because businesses now have an opportunity to plan for for the fall and, and for 2021 in a way that they really didn't back in, in March. This came, this came on us uh, as a total surprise. And so it's very, very different if you're a business owner and you're told 
you know, you've got to shut down tomorrow versus, oh, we may have a, a period where you need to adjust your operation schedule six months from now. Mm -hmm. If you can plan for that, it makes it far easier to adjust to. So I think that if we do see uh, another outbreak in the fall, it's going to be far less damaging than we saw in, in, in March and April. And I think businesses are aware of that and they're trying to plan for that now to, to minimize any negative effects. Enjoy with just about 30 seconds left. I want to get your thoughts on maybe onshoring some manufacturing back to the state, back to the country. As a result of this pandemic, we've seen medical supply chains all across the country and the world being squeezed because of this. Uh, do we see that as a possibility, some momentum there to bring those supply chains back to South Carolina and the United States? I think in a limited sense, yes, because manufacturers are always looking for secondary suppliers if their primary ones are unavailable. But the the manufacturing cluster and the advanced manufacturing cluster in particular in South Carolina has taken years to, to set up and it's highly efficient. So I don't see any major disruptions there going forward. But yes, on the margin, I think there will be some, some impacts because Again, every manufacturer is always looking for backups, and they're aware now that a pandemic is something they have to deal with. Gotcha. Dr. Joey Von Nessen, who's a research economist at the Dollar School of Business at University of South Carolina. Joey, thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Gavin. Always a pleasure. Thanks. To keep you updated throughout the week on COVID-19 and other state news, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast you can find on any podcast app or on southcarolinapublicradio.org. We've been dropping it more frequently as the COVID-19 pandemic persists. From South Carolina ETV Studios, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.